presentation of To the Best of My Knowledge on WPSU is made possible in part by support from the Penn State Alumni Association, informing, involving, and inspiring Penn State alumni and students through its publications, programs, and events. On the web at alumni.psu.edu. And from the members of WPSU. From the studios of Penn State Public Broadcasting, this is to the best of my knowledge. Good evening, I'm Graham Spanier, and tonight we'll talk about etiquette. You know, etiquette rules have changed over the years, but people still make judgments about how we act in social and business situations. Most behavior that is labeled as disrespectful or discourteous is unintentional and can be avoided by practicing good manners and etiquette. Tonight we'll provide tips on everything from making introductions to answering cell phones. We'll also take your telephone calls at 1-800-543-8242 and you can email us at response at psu.edu. And now let's meet our guests. Kathleen Crilly is director of the Kathleen Crilly School of Etiquette in Alexandria, Pennsylvania. And also with us is Diana Zeiske, an etiquette coach who works to polish the manners of her academic, corporate, and institutional clients. Thank you both for being on our program tonight. It's I think pleasure. it's going to be interesting and a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Kathleen, <laughs> let me start by asking you to explain the difference between good manners and etiquette. There are differences and uh, in many cases good manners and etiquette overlap. We like that when it happens. But generally good manners are, um, are inspired by a good heart. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, and good manners come from inside. Etiquette uh, and good manners refers, the term refers to the way we behave when we behave well and kindly and with consideration of others. Etiquette uh, refers to a code, codified uh, rules of behavior, and um, that is the main difference. Mm -hmm. And Diana, I presume people can be trained to have better manners and to know what these rules are. How, how do you go about doing that? Absolutely. Um, to Kathleen's point, it is codes and rules, but basically what I teach is that etiquette is simply the ability to make the people around you feel comfortable. It is, that's what corporations, that was, that's what my clients look to hire me for, is to train groups or train individuals in group settings primarily uh, how to feel comfortable at, around each other because it certainly can be taught. Not everybody is taught at home from an early age and sometimes the corporations, companies want to better their employees by making them able to eat correctly at luncheons or dinners or just in socialization with peers and with colleagues. Mm -hmm. I've been to dinners with college students where someone comes in and teaches them the etiquette and they make it a little complicated. They put about five forks down and three <laughs> knives and I don't know how many spoons and glasses and rows of uh, you know wine glasses and, and so on. Uh, it can get kind of complicated. How worried should people be about all of this? I don't think people have to be worried because um, it's not rocket science. And I always emphasize issues versus details. And we always want to think of the issues mainly. And the issues are that uh, we take into consideration the other people around us. And, and we have some, and I'm sure Diana does too, some little secrets that make things much easier. <laughs> right, and when we set, when we do presentations, when all those table settings are set, it's really just so that the people that are attending those type of etiquette events, so that they know like the worst case scenario or which, which utensil to use when. It's, it's not always going to be set at like that, like an etiquette presentation at a normal dinner. You know, half the time, 
I seem to pick up the dinner fork to eat my salad first, mm -hmm. and, I, and then they take away the fork, and I realize, oops, mm -hmm. I'm left with a salad fork. <laughs> well, it's never bothered me. I just eat my dinner with the mm -hmm. salad fork. But I bet there are some people who get a little panicked about it, thinking that they're leaving a terrible impression or upsetting the dinner. And that would be a shame if yeah, that happened, absolutely. because good manners are so much yeah. more than using the right fork. Oscar Wilde said over a hundred years ago, the world was my oyster and then I used the wrong fork. But uh, that doesn't work like that. <laughs> Nobody is going to lose their life um, goal by using the wrong, the wrong fork. fork. It's a detail. Yeah. I mean, it can be a detail. Now, what are some of the things that people worry about the most? Pretty much the basics, the not being, not looking polished enough, or what if somebody, it's actually, I get a lot of questions when somebody takes um, somebody else's glass. You know, if, if they notice that somebody took my glass, what should I do? Should I tell them about it or should I not tell them about it? Uh -huh. Well, no, you shouldn't tell them about it. Just call a server over and ask them to replace your glass because you don't want to make that person feel uncomfortable. But people are very concerned about how they look to the people that they're dining with, and which is good, but they shouldn't leave sleep over. As long as you have the knowledge that I know how to use my utensils, I know that I've been taught correctly, the way you hold yourself is really the primary thing, is good manners, mm -hmm. being able to communicate well with people. And then once that goes, the other details will fall mm -hmm. into place. And usually meals are so much more than the food. Yeah. Really, especially in business, for example, when you go to a business meal, your emphasis is not on the food, and your emphasis is on the business at hand. The topic. And yes, and socially, too. We want to interact with people and enjoy, enjoy the time together and relate to people. So if we get these little details out of the way, like which fork to use and where is our butter plate and... Uh, how do we get the peas onto our fork? And then we can concentrate on the real issues, business or socialization, or that fuzzy area of combination, business and mm -hmm. socialization. Now, I would, this would be a horror story to some people, but <laughs> I uh, attend lunches and dinners five to 10 times a week where there's maybe 10 people at a round table. And sometimes it gets very crowded and there's so much silverware and so many plates and glasses on that little table. And one of the things that happens, it, different uh, servers or different restaurants, different banquet managers will do different things with the napkins. Sometimes they're over here. Sometimes they're in a coffee cup. Sometimes yes. they're in the middle mm -hmm. of your plate. Sometimes they're at the top. And it's easy sometimes to, for the first person at the table to start with the wrong napkin. And then the next person sits down and they don't know which way to go with theirs. And that can be an awkward moment. Mm -hmm. Now, when that happens with me, we have a little fun with it. Yep. You want to send your napkin over across the table so everybody's got one now. But what are the napkin rules? There, it's set, it, place settings typically read, the way I teach it, is BMW. Bread is always in the upper left, meal is always directly in front of you, and your W, which is your water, or your beverages are always to your right. So whether your napkin is in a coffee mug on the right-hand side, if it's in directly in front of you, you know that's yours. Mm -hmm. If it's on a coffee mug, which a lot of times local venues like to place in coffee mugs, if it's on the right-hand side, if you know that your drinking glasses are always on your right, mm -hmm. that napkin is yours. Um, but if you do, if there is a mix-up, just as if somebody were to take your water glass by mistake and you're not in a situation where you can be joking or where you can, like you say, have fun with it, you just call a server over and just say, could you bring me a, a new nap, or could, could you bring me a napkin? But again, it's very situational. There's been many times where people have jokingly said, oh, I'm missing a napkin, can somebody just toss one over to me? But if you're not in that type of situation, I would just say have a server bring you a new one. Mm -hmm. And napkins, um, napkins do pose other problems for people too. I have heard of people eating a whole meal and their napkin remains, remains where it had, had been placed initially. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's important to, 
if, and I think we discussed this one other time, that uh, the host or hostess signals the beginning, the beginning of the meal by placing the napkin on his or her lap if there is a mm -hmm. host or a hostess. But a guest doesn't want to take the napkin before the host or hostess does because there might be grace Correct. being said or oh. something else. But if, if you are a whole group just out together to eat, you want to put the napkin on your lap um, before you begin, of course, and after you've located your napkin. And you don't want to make any flourishes. You don't want to do any of that. Just lift the napkin off the table. And when it is off the table or out of the mug or out of the glass, then you unfold it on your lap. The fewer movements above the table, the better. So you remove the napkin, place it on your lap, and unfold it. You know, we live in this electronic era now, and, and more and more things are electronic. Uh, we'll talk later, I hope we have time, uh, about cell phone etiquette. But something very basic is about thank you notes. And I must admit, uh, because I go to so many different events, I do write a lot of thank you notes. Increasingly, I will send somebody an email just thanking them. It's very quick and it's very easy for me, and I'm not aware that anybody has minded being thanked mm -hmm. that way. But I know I still get a lot of thank you notes that are handwritten, and I, I must say, I think, well, that's very nice. They went to the trouble mm -hmm. to write me a little note and send it. Am I uh, engaged in a, a terrible faux pas for sending an email <laughs> thank you note? The email, and I'm sure Diana will have information on this too, email has become so dominant and so convenient for both sender and receiver. And also email has the uh, advantage of being almost instant. I mean, you can just shoot out an email and the person gets the information immediately. There are, however, some cases when you want to instead write a nice handwritten note because it's always wonderful to, to receive a handwritten note. So it depends on the situation, and uh, again, it's situational. Or do both. I've taught my, my clients that shoot a quick email mm -hmm. right after the event or right mm -hmm. after whatever you're thanking them for, and then send the thank you. I mean, it could be a week, a week and a half, two weeks later, but at least you gave the courtesy of acknowledging the thank you at first, and then the unexpected, uh, letter that they get in the mail later. Mm -hmm. yeah. That would be nice. Mm -hmm. And it's just nice to have, and I've heard this term frequently and I believe in it, the attitude of gratitude. Mm -hmm. I mean it just feels good to be grateful and mm -hmm. and to be appreciative and to express your appreciation whether it's by email or in a thank you note. Yeah. Well you know I've got a million questions but I know our viewers do as well. If you've just joined us. I'm Graham Spanier, President of Penn State, and this is to the best of my knowledge on WPSU, Penn State Public Broadcasting, and the Pennsylvania Cable Network. Our topic tonight is etiquette with Kathleen Crilly, director of the Kathleen Crilly's School of Etiquette in Alexandria, Pennsylvania, and Diana Zeiske, an etiquette coach who works with academic, corporate, and institutional clients. You can join the conversation. Call us at one 800 543-8242 or email us at response at psu.edu. Now let's open up our phone lines and go first to Bob who is calling from Altoona. Hello Bob, you're on the air. Okay, thank you. My question is, is it proper etiquette for a homeowner to ask their guests or someone who comes to their door to remove their shoes at the door before they come into the house? This is something that sort of bothers me, and I've looked in several etiquette books, uh -huh. and I could not find anything written on it. Now, you're saying it bothers you when you've gone to homes and they've asked you to take your shoes off? Yes, yes. Okay. I don't think I should have to do that, and uh -huh. I don't request it at my home. All right. Well, that's an interesting question. <laughs> Any, uh, I, I don't know if an answer to that is in an etiquette book anywhere, so maybe you can help us through that one. Well, oh, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, Dan. Well, like I had said before, etiquette is about making the people around you feel comfortable. And what that basically means is when you're asked to do something like that, 
you're making them feel more comfortable. And I understand that you may not do that in your home, but if somebody has invited you into their home, you do need to kind of respect their wishes. Um, but it also may be a cultural thing. Some cultures do require people to remove their shoes when they enter into the house. Um, I would say that, Bob, this is a time when we are thinking of the situation. Mm -hmm. If somebody has just had their carpets cleaned or if the weather is extremely wet, uh, they might ask or make some kind of um, um, implication that they would prefer that you remove your shoes. And then, as Diana said, you, of course, would want to comply with that. However, I suppose there are some people who just uh, w always want their guests to remove their shoes for whatever reason. And uh, that, could be, that could be uncomfortable if you weren't prepared to do that. So if somebody has that general rule and they have invited you, they might uh, let you know ahead of time and also provide you with a little pair of slippers or some type of sock to wear while you're in their home so you're not walking around in your stocking feet. You know, I was in Asia recently. You, you mentioned cultural differences, and I was in many places where that was the custom. Mm -hmm. And in, in some places, slippers were given, in other mm -hmm. places, not. Uh, but everybody there had their shoes off. It was mm -hmm. sort of quasi-religious, mm -hmm. I, I would say, in, uh, mm -hmm. in some situations. So I think what I hear you saying is that, as a general rule, if you are someone's guest and this appears to be important to them, the polite thing to do is to comply with their, their wishes. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're doing it in your home and it's not that important to you from a religious standpoint or you haven't just finish the floors, uh, you probably would want to avoid expecting your guests to do that, I would assume. People it's, it's also take cues from you. So mm -hmm. I, I, many times you will, um, for example, if I have people at my house, I notice that if they see shoes by my door, they will yes. immediately take off their shoes. Uh -huh. Even when I say, oh, you don't have to, but they see their shoes by the door, they feel more comfortable taking off their mm -hmm. shoes. People take cues from that's true. Different situations. So, and right. some people just arrive and take off their Absolutely. shoes because, mm -hmm. because they do that in their own home. home. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So yeah. they mm -hmm. bring their habit uh, to your home. Mm -hmm. So you're both already making an important point. I think uh, that it's an overriding theme of discussions of etiquette we've had before. Flexibility. Yes. Oh, yeah. Adaptability. Yes. Flexibility. Yes. Very much mm -hmm. so. Don't get too concerned about it if you're hosting and also if you're a guest or you're at a table at a group event, it's it's going to be okay. You're not yes. going to be judged mm -hmm. in life Absolutely. because exactly. you did one little thing Absolutely. wrong. Yes. Exactly. And you could even then go in and sit down and use the wrong fork and uh -huh. everything yes. would still be, be okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. Let's uh, go to Linda. Linda is calling from Bethlehem. How are you doing, Linda? Fine, thank you. Glad to have you on the show. Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm an aspiring uh, engineer. I'm a student at Penn State. And I've tried to um, acquire recommendations for internships, and I've had a lot of difficulty. I, my grades range from A's and B's. I have no C's or D's. And yet I've been, uh, my teachers have been very evasive and have not really uh, given me any um, any encouragement by giving me any recommendations by telling me that they're, you know, doing other things and they, you know, they can't get to it. Um, and I'm just wondering what I, what I can do to, uh, you know, um, acquire these recommendations. Well, we probably all have thoughts on that one, including me, and I'll tell you why, because I'm often on the other end of that with lots of students asking for recommendations students I don't really know very well. Now any student who I know well and think highly of I will always give a recommendation but it's always a little awkward when they want a recommendation just perhaps because I'm president of their university but they don't understand most references don't really want to hear from someone who's not familiar with the candidate so uh, I will often tell people that I don't feel I'm sufficiently acquainted uh, with you um, 
But I suspect it's difficult when uh, the student asking is trying to get a reading, whether it's because they really don't have the time or don't want to, or they don't feel it would be a positive recommendation and it's just a way of kind of easing them away, thinking maybe you ought to ask someone else. And they say it's because of time commitments, but they're not sure they could give a positive recommendation or know them well enough. And that should be explained, obviously, to the person that is asking yes. the recommendation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because then that person is just in limbo, then wondering if he yeah. or she is going to get it. But it also depends on how that how you asked for that recommendation. Did, was it just verbal? Um, was there a letter written? Was an email sent asking for this? Because sometimes if it's just verbal, the the person being asked the recommendation may have just forgotten. But if you you know maybe send an email and then another email reminding that person t for the mm -hmm. recommendation, you may get more results that way. Or a letter. What I find is helpful is the request along with their yes. resume because yes. sometimes. They're in a gray area. I know them, but I'm not yeah. sure I know enough about them to Absolutely. good. But then I see the resume and say, wow, there's a lot of things I could say very positively about that individual. Mm -hmm. So I get the request plus the resume. Uh, the worst thing is to ask somebody for reference who says yes, and then they don't do it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. your application for the job or graduate school, or whatever it might be, is, is left hanging. Mm -hmm. Well, I would recommend to Linda that she think about future references before the moment she needs them. And this is a, a good thing to think about when you're developing relationships with your instructors or with uh, staff. And select somebody who knows you and who can feel good about writing a reference for you. And um, and talk to them about it. And so it's good to build as many relationships as you can throughout your education so somebody can be prepared and willing to write you a reference. This is To the Best of My Knowledge. I'm Graham Spanier, and we're here with our two guests, Kathleen Crilly and Diana Zesky. We're talking about etiquette. And on the air with us now is Vivian, who's calling in from Westfield. Hi, Vivian. Hi. What is your question? I was wondering about the proper or correct wording on wedding invitations. Uh, should both parent, sets of parents' names be on the invitation, or should it be issued just from the bride's parents? Hmm. There used to be very strict rules about there used that. To be. Now I see everything there on used wedding to be. invitations. Yes, um, it's a very, very good question. It's again very situational. It's dependent upon who is paying for the wedding, actually, because sometimes the bride and the groom do pay for the wedding themselves. And in that case, they can just have their names on it. They are inviting you. If the parents of the bride are paying for the event, or the majority, I should say, of the event, their names are listed first. They're the ones that are inviting. But also, the groom's side of the family, yes, absolutely can be put onto the invitation. There really is, there used to be, like you said, very strict rules mm -hmm. on how to write on invitations, but nowadays there's even invitations to weddings that are sent out via email. You know, mm -hmm. so times have really changed, but absolutely, very good question. Yes, both sets of the parents can be written on the invitation itself. It seems like things are becoming a little more egalitarian with regard to weddings. A little bit more relaxed, You're yes. seeing more of both sets of parents announcing yes. the wedding or inviting people. Uh, in the Traditionally, it was the bride's parents, and then they would mention the groom's parents Absolutely. down below. And the reason for that is because the bride's parents were the, primarily, the, the primary people of paying for the event, mm -hmm. um, but not so much anymore. You'll see more and more groom's families giving more money or giving more finances towards the actual event. It or may, more couples. Or more couples, yes, absolutely. Paying for their mm -hmm. own wedding. Yeah. And yes. sometimes couples mm -hmm. will decide that they, since they're paying for their wedding, they just want to invite their guests. Nobody else is helping them. Is but, there any awkwardness uh, when the parents have been divorced and now remarried, awkwardness about including the new spouse's name somewhere in the mix? Or is that pretty much not done? Well, that's very dependent 
on the situation, on the family. Uh -huh. I'm sorry, Kathleen. Uh, yes, 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 it would be dependent on the whole situation. Yes, indeed, because you could get quite a list of people there. Uh -huh. It could be. <laughs> it could be a very long invitation <laughs> yeah. with uh, the complexity of families yes. today. Yes. Sure. <laughs> Kelly from Pennsylvania Furnace, thanks for joining our program tonight. Good evening. Um, my question has to do with child rearing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a mother of uh, young children. I have two children. And I was curious what the appropriate way um, for a child to address an adult nowadays, as far as if things have changed, if, um, since our society is a little more informal now. I just was curious what the etiquette is yeah, today. Yeah, yeah. You know, I have, I have friends who I've known all my life and they have drummed into their kids that they have to call me Dr. Spanier. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, well, that's a little formal, but you know what, I let them do whatever they want to do and others, they'll call me Graham or mm -hmm. um, it they'll gets, make up a nickname. Yeah. It <laughs> gets very confusing with parents and children. Generally, when I teach children's etiquette, I teach to the children uh -huh. to address adults by Mr. or Mrs. or Doctor. And uh, then, of course, if the adult wants them to call them something else, they will discuss that and tell them. However, I have had numerous, especially teenagers, say to me, uh, when I call my friend's parents Mr. or Mrs., um, they say, oh, don't do that. It mm -hmm. makes me feel old. Call mm -hmm. me by my first name. Mm -hmm. So actually, it depends, I suppose, on the parent, mm -hmm. um, Kelly, whichever you would feel comfortable with. However, I think, I think it's always good to err on the side of, of caution and it can't hurt to teach your children to address adults uh, with Mr. or Mrs. or Doctor. And then if those adults prefer something else, they can tell them. Mary from Longhorn is next in the queue. Hi, Mary. Hi. Um, I, have a, I have a question um, about my son's prom and his girlfriend's prom. Mm -hmm. He's a senior and she's a junior and they're going to each other's proms, mm -hmm. should he pay for her tickets also and his senior tickets, or should she pay for the junior proms tickets? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like I was always paying no matter what. <laughs> it's, I love these wedding and prom questions. Um, I own a bridal shop, so we have a lot of people coming in you with these sorts of questions yes, I, I have, with, especially with the invitation question. But um, it's, again, very dependent on the entire situation. Typically, I will tell you, though, that the person that has invited is usually the one that pays. Mm -hmm. Invited that person is the one that pays. Um, it can get a little costly, so it, they, the couple might decide to split it but typically, the if the if the if the gentleman if the young man has invited the young lady, he is the one that does pay, and he also does get her a corsage or a boutonniere. So, if in that situation that she described, where the girl is the junior and there's a junior prom, in a sense, she's doing the inviting, even though if they're they're a couple and they both expect it, she's the host, the host. of that particular yes. prom and should buy the, the tickets. tickets. Mm -hmm. Now, right. there may be financial considerations. Right, and that's what you need to consider. Is it, is it okay to do for them, or is there something that they can do to split the cost? Mm -hmm. But yes, usually the inviter. And whatever it is, they should be aware of what they're doing, yeah. uh -huh. so there's no question or no mystery about it. It should be decided ahead of time so they can make subsequent decisions uh, that are going to work for them for the whole prom season. Yeah. They need to be aware of that. That question always comes up about dating and dinner, mm -hmm. or even friends going out for dinner mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, paying. There, it should never be a surprise who's yeah. paying for what. That should be worked out ahead of time. Especially in business, too. Oh, especially, especially in business. Especially in business. If you're invited for a business lunch. Mm -hmm. That's actually more simple, so, though, yes, because it is. that is one time when, as you but said. But many people don't. Mm -hmm. No. And you're right. You know, you're right, especially with know. gender. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. But that all should be worked out ahead, ahead of time. time. 
no surprises. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. People find it awkward generally to talk about money. Yes. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. having a conversation ahead of time about who's going to pay can be yeah. awkward. Mm -hmm. I suppose the time to do it is when somebody's doing the inviting, saying, yes. oh, I just want you to know you're my guest. Good so, point, Dr. So that Spaniel. they don't yes. have to have a separate mm -hmm. conversation as the time approaches. By Excellent. the way, we never decided exactly. who's paying. Yes, exactly. yes, that's, that's very tactful. Now there's a, an example of good man. Manners. Yes, to do it that way, that's tactful and considerate of the situation, and yes, that's perfect. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> uh, Mary from Erie, what, uh, what would you like to put on the table for our discussion? Good evening. Uh, thank you for taking my call. Uh, my question is, I have four teenagers, and what I would like to know is, what are some helpful hints that uh, helpful skills basically that I could use to introduce the importance of etiquette to my four teenagers who might be somewhat resistant to thinking that this is an unimportant topic but actually it is as they you know grow older and um, move into uh, you know more social settings. Great question for our experts. I have 40,000 teenagers by the way at Penn State <laughs> but I have no advice on this topic. Mm. Kathleen, what would you say? Well, generally the uh, teenager will feel uncomfortable in some situation or when they're in some transition, for example, going from not dating to dating or if they're going into an interview situation or if they're um, something where they might feel challenged because Etiquette really is part of um, a skill um, buildup. And so if, if you can make it practical for your children to, to think of uh, what's in it for them uh, with learning rules of etiquette, I think, uh, and demonstrating to them, I think they'll be more um, amenable to, to learning etiquette. That's my opinion. Absolutely, I agree. Uh, the only thing I can tell you is send them to Kathleen, one of Kathleen's classes, <laughs> or one of mine. But they are etiquette is really fun, and when I teach freshmen, mm -hmm. I I have I run into a little bit of that that they're freshmen and they may not be having to use what I teach them for a while because they're not getting out into the real world for a while. But it really is such a fun area. It's really people take time to dress, take girls and, and young men like to take time to look good. And etiquette is just an extension of that. It's just knowing how to hold yourself, knowing how to navigate a room or work a table. It's really just an extension of your everyday wear, your everyday look and manners. It's a, mm -hmm. also manners. So it's just something very fun and just <laughs> very well, to me, interesting, maybe not so much to a teenager, but something that they will definitely use, and I know it's hard to get that into a young person's mind, but something that they will definitely use through the rest, for the rest of their lives. You know, I've had wonderful results with uh, teenagers just doing simple exercises, uh, lining them up and having them stand as they usually stand, and then teaching them how to stand mm -hmm. with good uh, posture. And they can see, I don't have to say anything, they can see the difference in the presentation of their peers. Mm -hmm. and, um, it, and as mm -hmm. Diana said, it is fun. They have fun. They have fun writing thank you notes mm -hmm. and sharing those. And I found that college students love going to these etiquette yeah, dinners that they're very sometimes receptive. are put on through our business school or mm -hmm. our Nittany Lion and we'll do it. Mm -hmm. I, I attended one of those once, and that's where I actually learned what the rules were about what to do with a napkin. <laughs> if you left the table, table. Yes. or after a meal. <laughs> yes. So now after a meal, I always folded up my, my napkin in a just the nice, just like it came almost. Uh-oh. And, <laughs> and I learned, no, 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 you're just supposed to leave it <sighs> sort of crumpled. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, folded loosely. Folded loosely. Well, well tell <laughs> yes. us what folded loosely means. Well, it's between crumpled and folded neatly. Yeah. It is just in loose folds. And you just kind of set it down in a not spread all over right, the place. Right, right. You don't the want uh, the soiled 
parts exposed and mm -hmm. it would just be folded loosely and if your plate had been removed you would put it where your plate had been uh -huh. but if your plate is still there you would put it to the left of and your what plate. if you're have to, having to leave the table in the middle of the meal but you're coming right back I teach that you put it on your seat. That is the classic way. Oh, good. Then I'm doing that right. Yes. Because yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and in really fancy places, somebody quick comes up and refolds it for you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They do. That can throw you off. It makes me nervous. <laughs> and what are they doing with my napkin there? Just leave it. I'm coming back. You know. It's, well, yes, some people might object to somebody else handling their oh, napkin. Oh, I'm not that worried about it, but, you know, you notice that... Uh, it's right. different. Right. Yeah, yeah, in different places. I think that's a good word to remember, too, just to notice, uh -huh. just being aware of mm -hmm. what's happening around us. Yeah. Now, we're going to do a little quiz here. It's going to be a real, real brief one. How much do you know about etiquette? We're going to test your knowledge with just three etiquette questions and here's the first one. In fact, I'll give you all three right now and the end of the show we'll try to leave a little time to get back to it. I find I'm often using my cell phone on the street when an acquaintance comes along and stops out of the social obligation after seeing. What should I do? Somebody comes along, you're on the street, do you continue talking on the phone since that was the party of your original connection or do you end the call to speak with the acquaintance on the street? I think a lot of people worry about the. They're on the phone. Somebody comes along. What do they do? Okay, here, here's a, a second question. Where should the dinner napkin be placed after you finish your meal? Oops. Now, this should be an easy one. <laughs> we just covered it. But, but here are the options, the official options in the quiz. Folded loosely and placed on the right side of the plate. We're giving them a little more specificity here. Folded loosely and placed on the left side of the plate. Folded loosely and placed in the center of the plate and placed on the seat of your chair. At the end of the meal, whereabouts do you <laughs> place this loosely folded napkin? And the third question, when socializing at a cocktail party, is it best to hold your glass in your right hand in your left hand or it doesn't make a difference okay now don't give us the answers right now we'll come back and leave a couple of minutes to talk about that but we'll kind of see how how everybody did on those things meanwhile let's turn to Shirley who's calling from Indiana hi Shirley hello the reason I'm calling I have hardwood floors throughout my home mm -hmm. and some people do not realize but your shoes bring in a lot of sand and fine particles of dirt. So what I do, I bought a box of disposable slippers that surgeons use in the operating room. And I, just, I have a little um, bench in the entrance, and I, I ask them, say, please put this over their feet. This way they don't have to remove their shoes. Yeah, okay. You don't get dirt all over your floors because, you know, it adds up. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, but, okay, Shirley, <laughs> you come up with a compromise solution. Yes. They don't take yes. their shoes off, but they have to put covers on. I don't know, it seems a little well, serious to me. What, what do you think? It's, it's again, situational. Yes, um, if it, it works. And if it works for her guests, right. then there should there's nothing wrong with it. Again, uh, there are... Um, there are actually some bridal stores, for example, I'm just using bridal stores yeah. as an example, yeah. that do require you to do that as well because the gowns are necessarily mostly white mm -hmm. and they don't want customers coming into the stores and tracking in soil because the gowns mm -hmm. trail on the floor. Oh, so yeah. they'll have little slippers for people to put out on sense. their shoes. Mm -hmm. So again, it's very situational. If her, if her guests are okay with that, there should be nothing wrong. Just as if you're going into a bridal store, some stores ask you to put on slippers so that you don't track in soil. But you would acknowledge that some people might feel that it's a little much. I mean, the only places uh, yes. I've ever had to do that is when I've been in an operating room mm -hmm. assisting or somebody mm -hmm. or in a nanotechnology, mm -hmm. nanofabrication mm -hmm. laboratory mm -hmm. or something. It, it's not very customary. But, no, um, you don't see it very often, I mm -hmm. don't think. But again... If her guests are okay with that, then yeah, to each his own. Yeah. Okay. To each his own. own. Yes, yeah. and it certainly isn't offensive. Mm -hmm. It is different. 
Absolutely, it's different, and uh, it might be something that people will comment mm -hmm. about. And uh, but otherwise, it's certainly not harmful, and it saves. Surely, no, it saves. Yeah, a lot of work for the homemaker. Lorraine from Hazelton, what's your question? Yes, it's a two-part question mm -hmm. concerning a wedding, uh, my son's wedding. Uh, the first question is, should it be my choice? in the hall when the bridal party and the mothers and fathers of the groom are being announced. Well, first of all, see, uh, my ex-husband is remarried, and I'll be walking in either alone or maybe with a brother. Now, is it okay to walk in alone? Should it be my choice, or should it be the, bride's and gr the bride and groom choice? Okay, hang on with your second question, because that's a nicely self-contained question, and I think I know what you're going to say. I'll let Diana do the bridal question. Okay. The first, remind me, I heard both the questions yes, together. I heard, I, I, well, should it be her choice to decide how she wants to be announced and whether she would come in alone or with a brother? Is that principally her decision in the circumstances uh, as the bride? I would love to say yes. I would love to say that's her choice. However, it's a two part. Mm -hmm. It is. It should be a decision that her, the bride and her come together yeah. on. Um, it is the bride's day, obviously, but having said that, she should take into consideration her mother's feelings. Um, mm -hmm. If her mother feels more comfortable going in by herself, then allow her to go in by herself. Okay, the yes. bride's decision, but take into consideration the mother's feelings. feelings. Absolutely, right. absolutely. And if the mother chooses to go in by herself, absolutely it is acceptable for mm -hmm. her to walk in by herself. She will just be announced by herself. Right. Mm -hmm. Lorraine, you had a second question, I think. Yes, uh, this might be a little bit more touchy. Okay. Okay. Um, now, when my husband is introduced with his wife, um, again, should the wife be introduced, now well, first of all, the father, like the father of the groom and his wife, or, now don't forget, I'll be coming after them, or the father of the groom and the stepmother. Now, does that sound tacky? Should, that, should there be respect for the mother and the mother alone? Now, that's a little touchy, but I would really love an answer and an opinion. Mm -hmm. The father of the groom and the name. Just uh, there, yes, there's, there's no reason there's no to give the title. relationship. Absolutely. Yes. You don't have mm -hmm. to describe no, her as no, the no, wicked no, stepmother no, no, or whatever no, she no. might be. The Just the name, the, yes. the, the announcement. Uh -huh. um, there is no title, Lorraine, that needs to be given. So you should not feel any awkwardness no. at all. Because you remain the mother and he remains, remains the, the father. father. And they are the issues, yeah. and um, correct. You're just going yes. to be announced mm -hmm. as the names, with the names, their names. And in the end, isn't it? I mean, if in doubt, of course, the bride and the groom should mm -hmm. discuss well, it and discuss you have it, the... work it out, and and probably if you want to err on one side or another, when you err on the side of inclusiveness and not let somebody feel left out Absolutely. because yes. there might be a hard well, feeling yes. about it. That's the MC's job of the event, too. The MC is usually your DJ or your, uh -huh. your band leader. Um, so that should be really discussed with the MC so that they know that there, there should not be any awkwardness, no hesitation, just no awkwardness. Mm -hmm. Randy is calling in from Bowlesburg. Good evening, Randy. Uh, good evening. Uh, my question deals with the tipping and whether or not it's um, needs uh, based on the service. Whether uh, you should tip based on the service or use a more standard percentage for tipping, not taking the service so much into account, is, is that what you're suggesting? Kathleen. Tipping is a, a very frequent question mm -hmm. because tipping does, um, tipping does pose problems for people. But we have to remember when wait staff are serving their clients, wait staff are also dependent upon kitchen staff and uh, there are a lot of things going on in a restaurant 
and it's generally a good idea to tip at least 15 percent of the before taxed um, dinner price and uh, the total bill and sometimes 20 percent and unless you get really rude horrendous service it is it's exceptional not to have an obligation to tip your your wait, waiter or waitress. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Don from Altoona on the air. Don, thanks. Well, thank you for taking my call, Dr. Spanier. Sure. Actually, some of these questions are really fascinating, and uh, I, I'm glad to hear that uh, uh, whenever uh, people are being introduced, you don't say such and such and the Wicked Witch of the West. <laughs> <laughs> Getting to my phone call, or my question, however, uh -huh. uh, I'm of a, uh, an older generation that was taught that whenever you were introduced to people, uh, you would automatically offer your hand to shake hands with a man, but you would always expect the woman to advance her hand uh, to shake it rather than extending one's hand to uh, shake a woman. With a um, number of the business and social settings that I've been over the years, I've noticed that the younger generation gets a... Uh, a little confused with that uh, whenever I have a, a woman that I need or that I'm meeting um, uh, both in business and in uh, other situations where if I don't offer my hand she feels as though I'm sort of uh, putting her uh, aside as it were how does one address this oh I, I love this topic yeah I love I this too. I love it's, this situation I I could talk for hours about it um, <laughs> Business etiquette is genderless. Mm -hmm. It's based on power and hierarchy. It's it's social etiquette that has, and correct me if I'm wrong, but social That's, etiquette mm -hmm. is based upon gender. In business, um, men and female are the same. So if you are being introduced to somebody, whether if it's a female, that person, that female, does have the right to extend her hand as, as, as well. You should expect that person to extend her hand, and you should do the same as well. Um, I, I love to emphasize the importance of handshakes, because just mm -hmm. as your appearance, your physical appearance, is the first thing that people see, the most important, the second thing that people see or feel is your handshake. And I think it's incredibly important to be very firm with your handshake and do offer a strong handshake um, as it is a signal or a, a sign of sincerity that you are really happy to meet that person or you really are pleased to make that person's acquaintance. Um, so in business, primarily, yes, when you are being introduced, one should extend their hand. Mm -hmm. And Don, I can see where you are confused because of, as Diana said, the difference between business and social situations. In social situations, it has uh, been maintained that the woman can be the one to offer her hand and the gentleman can hold back to uh, respect those traditional roles. So uh, socially, you should feel comfortable to expect the woman to extend her hand to you. But in business, no, as Diana said, we do not uh, defer to people through gender. It's all through, through the rank, the corporate mm -hmm. rank. And uh, this is a fine example, too, of how etiquette rules change. They mm -hmm. evolve. Mm -hmm. and, but good manners don't change because we consider, we consider others all the time. But yes, this is a perfect example mm -hmm. of the evolution of etiquette. Mm -hmm. Now, here's a variation on that that I actually it throws me off occasionally. I end up not worrying about it because people don't seem to care, but I know it's an important issue of etiquette, and that is when you have, uh, let's say I, I'm with somebody and there's a, a U.S. senator or a presidential candidate or the president of the United States, somebody very in a, in a very important, uh, clearly more senior role or status and someone in, in who gets introduced if you're doing the introducing who do you introduce to whom in mm -hmm. what order such a good question 
Yes, and such, uh, such mm -hmm. confusion. First mm -hmm. of all, let me say that the introduction is what counts. I mean, to perform mm -hmm. the introduction is the most important thing. But yes, it is important to, you introduce, for example, a junior person to a senior person. You introduce a non-official person, an unofficial person to an official person. And that gets confusing because you uh, to think of those orders. When I say you you um, introduce an unofficial person to an official person, that means you say, Mayor mm -hmm. Bloomberg, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Spanier. And because Mayor Bloomberg would take precedence over you, so you are introducing you to Mayor Bloomberg, mm -hmm. so it's Mayor Bloomberg. That's much more money. May than I present? I know that. <laughs> right, yeah. and yeah, a lot of the of students money. will ask me that, and it, 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 it does get a lot of confusing. So what I just say is basically, you say the persons of, and I and I don't mean it in a personal mm -hmm. level, but the persons of more importance. Mm -hmm. So if you're introducing your boss to your staff assistant, for example, you need to say your boss's name first. Right. And you are actually, yeah, introducing the staff assistant mm -hmm. to, to the, the boss. boss. Now, this, right. would the same apply, let's say, with someone who is clearly a, a more elderly person and a younger person, apart from their business status? Socially, yes. You'd pay yes. some deference to age. Yes. Socially, Or you status, do. or seniority in an organization. Socially. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Socially, as Diana said in the handshaking question, socially we defer to gender and age. Business or officially we defer to rank and status. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. We're going to try to take a couple more questions, but let me give the answers to those quizzes now. Mm -hmm. uh, remember, question number one was, I find I am often using my cell phone on the street when an acquaintance comes along and uh, what should I do? Continue talking on the phone since that was the party that originated the connection or B, which is the correct answer, end the call to speak with the acquaintance on the street. Now that's the official Emily Post manual answer. Would you agree with that? Of course, there might be nuances, but it's Generally speaking, you would very you? situational. It depends on the situation. In my, in my opinion, um, if you are, I'd like to change that just a tad bit and say mm -hmm. and bring it to a more realistic situation and say or put into a business situation where many times my clients will say to me, well, "We're at a business luncheon and somebody comes up to me to my table." and they can see me talking to my table. Do I need to interrupt my conversation to the people at my table and have yeah. a conversation with the person that has come up to me? And I said, no, because the people at your table are your primary focus. However, you do need to acknowledge the person that has come up to you, but, and you can have partake in a small conversation, but let it be at that, a small conversation and then make an excuse that we'll touch base later, I'll give you an email, I'll give you a quick call later, and then resume your attention back to the table. So it could be the same thing as passing on the street. Mm -hmm. You see somebody, you say, nice to see you, but I'm a, I, I need to take this, I need to finish this phone call, and continue with the phone call. Now uh, we, but <laughs> we, we talked about the napkin situation mm -hmm. before, and the correct answer, I won't read all the choices again, is folded loosely and placed on the left side of the plate. Kathleen? That is the correct answer. That? However, I have found in two different sources that uh, it is folded loosely and placed to the right, but that is incorrect. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, I have mm -hmm. seen that twice now. Place and, it to the yeah, left. And it, it is placed to the left, that is correct. Okay. And when socializing at a cocktail party, it is best to hold your glass in which hand? Left hand. <laughs> Left hand. And there's a good reason for that, yes, right? Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The right hand is the hand that we usually shake hands with, mm -hmm. and you want to make that hand very available. So if somebody comes up to you, you have that hand to extend your hand with to shake that person's hand. Or do you want to be changing hands with the glasses because no. now you're wet, it's cold. Exactly. And, and, and so nobody on. wants a wet, cold handshake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Victoria from Dubois, let's try to get your question in quickly. Well, thank you very much. My question is, with now we're coming into nicer weather, mm -hmm. and I work in a situation where I have to wear a business suit. 
is it proper to go without hose when wearing a business suit and high heels, or do we stick with it and go with hose? Boy, I, I can't, I can't help know. you on that one, Victoria, <laughs> but uh, I think our experts can. Oh, that has been debated so much, especially recently. I believe that uh, hose are appropriate. If you are wearing a business suit, and I believe, Gloria, you said you wear a business suit, my personal opinion and traditionally, yes, hose will complete complete your uh, image, your appearance, your your presentation of yourself. As soon as you remove your hose, you're saying something different about yourself. You're more casual. You're less committed to a professional image. So it's your choice. <laughs> but and it I, and Kathleen is absolutely correct. However, um, there are some. And there are some companies that do require you to wear hose. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, so it depends on the industry that you work in as well. Mm -hmm. I tell you, yes. life is getting complicated, it but is. also more flexible. <laughs> and we could talk about this topic all night, but alas, we are out of time. And I know we still have folks in the queue on the phone lines. Thanks to everybody for tuning into our program tonight. And thank you to our guests, Kathleen Crilly, director of Kathleen Crilly's School of Etiquette in Alexandria, Pennsylvania, and Diana Zeiske, etiquette coach and owner of Diamonds and Lace Bridal. And thank you for watching. We hope you'll join us again on Tuesday, April 7th, when our topic will be music appreciation with professor and Penn State laureate Kim Cook and conductor Gregory Woodbridge. Tonight's program will be stored in an electronic archive that can be accessed through WPSU.org. This site also links to online resources on tonight's topic. To the best of my knowledge is a production of Penn State Public Broadcasting. For all of us here, I'm Graham Spanier. Good night. Presentation of To the Best of My Knowledge on WPSU is made possible in part by support from the Penn State Alumni Association, informing, involving, and inspiring Penn State alumni and students through its publications, programs, and events. On the web at alumni.psu.edu. Penn State On Demand is a service of Penn State Public Broadcasting, and now you can support WPSU when you shop online. Visit wpsu.org slash shop to make purchases from national online retailers, and WPSU will receive a portion of the sale with no extra cost to you. So start your online shopping at wpsu.org slash shop.